Uh, I was asked by Anthony in September to, uh, will you talk at the conference on telling stories about marketing tool buildings? I immediately thought, yes, yeah, that'd be great. And then I thought, oh, wait, hang on a second. Most of the stories that I know about marketing tool buildings, I can't tell in uh, public uh, audiences. Um, so I have to be quite careful that I don't come and spill beans uh, in ways that clients of mine or projects that I've worked on wouldn't like. For example, uh, one of the early projects I worked on, a super tool, I won't tell you where or what it was called, um, we were filming it. We were filming the um, property manager outside and uh, we were underneath, standing on the podium at the top of the build, uh, looking at the top of the building and he kept looking up nervously. Um, all throughout this interview, he kept looking up nervously. And uh, after a while, we said, I is everything all right? He's like, he said, I don't really like standing under here. So why is that then? He said, well, because things keep dropping off. And he said, he said like the other day, uh, there was a, a man parked uh, by the traffic light at the bottom and somebody dropped a bolt off the top of the building. It went through the roof of the car, through the passenger seat. Fortunately, no one was sitting in it, through the bottom of the car and 10 inches into the pavement. So this poor man sitting there in the car suddenly hears this dunk looks down and there's a smouldering bolt-shaped hole in the, in, the, in the seat next to him, at which point he's paid $30,000 not to spill the beans on what's happened to him. So I've got a lot of stories like that. So if anybody finds me in the bar afterwards, I'll be happy to tell you about them. But today, I'm going to stick to much safer and simpler things. Um, word search are, uh, um, I'm, gonna be, I'm really sorry. First of all, to the translators, because I will, when I get excited, start to speak really quickly. And I might start moving around as well. So I'll try and keep to the microphone. Uh, Word Search and Marketing Agency, we work all over the world. We've got offices from Sydney, Beijing, Singapore, Hong Kong, London, New York, San Francisco. We work on all sorts of different projects. But as you can see, there's a list of the tall buildings we've worked on. And I thought rather than embarrass uh, lots of people and clients by telling you these stories, I would sort of take you through a little bit of the chronology of some of the tall buildings that we've worked on and then tell you um, some of the, uh, the conclusions that I've come to about how you sell effectively and how we should think about tall buildings. The first is a project we worked on probably, um, it was before the Millennium in London, called the Millennium Tower by Foster and Partners. And it was a, it was a huge, a huge project um, at a time when London had very few tall buildings. And this is a, um, a skyline of London. You can see the Gherkin is nearly completed. This is about 2002, 2003. When the Millennium Tower came along, it came as a result of uh, a, a bomb that had destroyed a building called the Baltic Exchange, and it was the first opportunity to create a really new building in the heart of the city of London, which had been for many years dominated by the Black Tower on the left-hand side, the NatWest Tower. And because London hadn't had any tall buildings and is protected by, uh, as Chris said, um, by the views of St Paul's, um, a radical solution was needed to shake up the city. And Foster and Partners came up with this, the London Millennium Tower, um, a thousand feet at a point where London was dominated by the NatWest Tower and St Paul's Cathedral. And as you can imagine, the planners retreated in shock at this immense tower that absolutely dominated or would have dominated the city to an extent that was completely um, hitherto unknown. Uh, and an interesting mixed-use project, a uh, city within a city, a stack of uses again, something not seen in the UK and not seen in the UK until the Shard, definitely not something of this height. But of course, this was not a serious plan. This was a classic tactic by a developer to create shock in the planning department so that when uh, they then came back with the building on the right-hand side. Uh, they think, they first of all, they go, a thousand feet in the middle of the city of London? You've got to be joking. Okay, how about this one? Okay, fine. I think that one we can live with, despite the fact it was taller than any other building that had been done in the city of London for a period of time. So an exciting way of shaking up um, and telling stories and, and getting things to happen. Uh, and the Gherkin it itself is a really fascinating project. When this building first came about, it was actually called Swiss Re, um, because it was developed by an owner-occupier, Swiss Re, the insurance company, and it is on 30 St Mary Axe. That's its address. In fact, the building is known as 30 St Mary Axe. And a, um, a journalist called Rowan Moore um, described the Gherkin as it was coming out of the ground, in fact, as the erotic Gherkin. Um, anybody who doesn't know, that's a Gherkin. Um, I don't know what an erotic gherkin looks like, um, but that's a gherkin. And I think you'll agree, um, I don't think there's a lot of similarity between that and the gherkin. But so incensed were Swiss Re by the idea of the erotic gherkin that the agents responsible for leasing this, the rest of the building, that they didn't take, were under pain of losing their jobs 
if they were heard to refer to the building of the Gherkin. So they would have been fired from the project if anybody had heard them calling it the Gherkin. Now, fast forward 10 years, when we worked on a, uh, when a new owner came in to take over the building from Swiss Re had bought it, and uh, they said, it's the Gherkin, right? It's absolutely the Gherkin, and they embrace the name of the Gherkin, and now if you go on the website, it's called the Gherkin. And they are completely happy because they know that that is the Gherkin. We were lucky enough to work on the Shard. I've worked on the Shard since about 2004, um, and a, a fantastic building that, you know, many years later only achieved the same heights as the Millennium Tower. Um, and I think it characterizes two fascinating things. One is, um, one is the idea of having a vision. Right? I think that the Shard is there because of the, the incredible vision and drive of a man called Irvine Seller, who uh, came up with the idea, he, he wanted to build a terrible building um, on the top of London Bridge Station in London. He was told by planners, you can't build, you've got to go to one of you know, three great architects if you're going to build a building of this size in this place. He went, found Renzo Piano. Renzo Piano uh, went to um, lunch with Irvine Seller, and uh, Renzo Piano sketched on a, on a napkin. Irvine still has a napkin. I think he believes that Renzo Piano actually came up with the building at the table rather than designing it for months beforehand and then saying, I've got this idea. I'll just draw it on a napkin for you. A brilliant piece of salesmanship by Renzo. Um, but Irvine Seller had this incredible vision that he drove through, through recessions to deliver this extraordinary building, this fantastic building. And the project architect, William Matthews, once told me, he said, you know, the thing is, Irvine Seller had never done a building like this, and Renzo Piano had never done a building like this. And if either of them had, they wouldn't have done a building like this. Uh, and I think the complexity of it's still the only truly mixed-use building in London which delivers hotel, uh, residences, restaurants, bars, office space, as well as retail at ground level on top of a mainline rail railway station and a subway station and a bus station. Um, it is an extraordinary, uh, uh, an extraordinary proposition that only a developer with real vision can deliver. But interestingly, when Renzo first introduced the project, he said it's like shards of glass. He described it as being, it's like shards of glass. And for anybody who doesn't know, that's what shards of glass look like. And obviously, shards of glass are not particularly attractive when it comes to talking about grade A buildings um, over the, you know, taking over the skyline of a city. And the developer was pretty, he said, well, shards of glass, I think shards is a very negative term. I'm not sure we can call it shards of glass. And we said to him, no, 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 it's fine. Because actually there is this anthropomorphization of buildings. You know, we're taking these buildings into our heart. Embrace shard. Embrace shard. It's a great opportunity. In any way, it'll change. And I think what's happened and what this has shown that now, if you say the shard to anybody, they don't think of broken pieces of glass anymore. They think of the shard. The shard has now taken over the meaning of the word shard. The Leadenhall building. Um, uh, uh, Chris touched upon it. It's a the cheese grater um, in the city of London, a really, I think, one of the top 10 great office buildings in the world of all time. I, I really love this building. I was fortunate enough to work on it, part of the planning application process, the public consultation process, and the pre-let marketing for it. Um, and I think that the city of London creates some really spectacular buildings because of the constraints, not in spite of them. And I think the medieval street pattern, the extremely demanding planners, the highly competitive market, uh, create really extraordinary uh, buildings that have to respond to all of those different obstacles. And the cheese grater does that. The cheese grater has to lean back, as Chris said, away from St Paul's so it doesn't touch the dome of St Paul's. And that is what then creates this fantastic shape and something that is particularly special, I think, about buildings in London. Um, and it sits, this is a slightly, um, this is a slightly older CGI. It doesn't include all of the buildings. But you can see here, um, from the opposite side, the view of St Paul's between that slant. On the left-hand side is a building that's coming out of the ground that we're also working on called the Scalpel, another nickname which I'll go on to in a second, which is leaning back in the opposite way to also maintain that amazing view of St Paul's. And I think you get some really efficient, fantastic buildings out of it. Um, which then also leads one on to nicknames generally. Uh, and I was really gratified to hear that the SOM building across the way is called the Big Thumb, because I didn't realize that um, other cities were giving nicknames to their buildings in the same way. But there's something very particular about London and its nicknames, and I think it's something to do with the British and their nicknames. British people give mean nicknames to the things they love. So if, if you have a nickname in Britain, it's probably fatty or baldy or shorty or thicky or something like that. If you have a nickname in America, it's probably Ace or Iceman or Maverick or something cool. If in Britain you're given a nickname like Maverick or Iceman, you probably gave it to yourself. Uh, and so it's not taken very seriously. And so there is a, a habit of naming buildings with slightly rude names. And this is, excuse me for a minute, because I'll have to go away from the microphone. Um, here we have the can of pan. 
uh, the Pinnacle, which is the building which the CCTV did, is no longer happening because the Pinnacle is a, is a nickname that they obviously gave themselves. So if nobody likes it, the building isn't happening. Uh, <laughs> the cheese grater, the gherkin, uh, the scalpel, and the walkie talkie. And None of the developers wanted their buildings to be called those things. I remember talking with British Land, they're like, oh, the cheese grater, oh, it's so demeaning, it's a cheese, you know, but actually the fact that we embrace these buildings, we give them these slightly ludicrous names, means that we love them. Uh, and this photograph, which my father took when Foster and Partners, Foster and Partners went to go and see R Richard Rogers' partnership, who've now gone into their building at the, the cheese grater, and they presented them with this, the cheese and pickle, which shows you how far these nicknames have gone to characterize and make us embrace these buildings. One World Trade Center. Um, for a company that specializes in branding and marketing of tall buildings, this really is, you know, the pinnacle project. You couldn't really get much uh, more important than a building like this, and it was extraordinary. And I'd sort of go to a slightly more serious point for the moment, because this was, um, we, as part of our process of, of helping to communicate this building, we did a four-year communications plan, which started because the Port Authority had been working for a number of years, and people had had this perception that nothing had happened on the site, whereas, in fact, they'd built 600,000 square feet below grade at a point when uh, there was a, a subway line running across the middle of the site with a 12 millimeter um, uh, movement allowance at working 24 hours a day whilst dealing with all of what had happened at, uh, on the site. And we met 65 different stakeholders to interview them about the importance of the building and what we needed to do to understand this project and help to communicate it and move it forward. And as part of that process, we met this man, Alan Rees. Alan, and this was the most extraordinary meeting I've ever had in my life on anything, but particularly on tool buildings that I will ever have again. And he was on the day of 9-11, he was the manager of the Twin Towers. And he told us how he had cheated death on two occasions. When the first tower came down, he was inside a police station. The building had collapsed on top of it, and he survived, and he dug his way out to then help carry on help, helping. And as the second building came down, he was walked behind a, 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 a side of a building just as it came down, and he survived that as well. Uh, and we're sitting in this meeting listening to this extraordinary story. And he says, and I'll tell you what motivates me to make sure that we deliver this project on time, and particularly to make sure that we deliver the memorial on the 10th anniversary. And he said, and this is why. And he moved all the papers off his desk, and underneath the glass on the front of his desk were photographs. And he said, these are the photographs of all of the Port Authority employees who I employed who died on 9-11. And he said, for the two years after the event, I had a policeman with me 24 hours a day and with a car waiting, and any time they found the remains of one of these people, they were, I was taken to the, to the family's house, and I was to notify them that we'd found the remains of their family member. And I'm crying, he's crying, my colleagues are crying. We're sitting this welling up in this thing, thinking this is, this is about, that is motivation to make sure a building happens. And he told me this extraordinary story about making sure the memorial got delivered. Admittedly, this isn't a tall building story, but I still think it's important. He said the, the memorial wasn't going to get delivered on time, and they needed someone who had skin in the game, as he, as he described it. He said, and we ended up with Tom, and he said, I'll tell you a bit about Tom. He said, Tom was a retired US Marine, and he lost friends on 9-11. And he said, I'll show you the motivation he has to make this happen on time. He said, uh, in the days afterwards, the basement's filled with water. And uh, he took a, a rubber dinghy, and he squeezed it through the doorways into the basements, and he spent three days with a head torch paddling around the basements trying to find his friend. He didn't find any. That's how motivated Tom is to finish this. So I still think that that is one of the most extraordinary projects, one of the most complicated construction projects in human history, and, and quite an amazing and, and humbling thing to be involved with. Taipei 101. Uh, an amazing tall building, a fantastic opportunity to work on an incredibly exciting story. And I think what was extraordinary about this when we started working on it is that you know, we spent a lot of time trying to understand people's motivations, trying to understand their vision, what are they trying to deliver. That is why I think you can make successful projects, as I've said. And in Taipei, they were incredibly open about what they were trying to achieve. Normally, we talk about uh, you know, the user environment, we talk about space, we talk about lots of different things. But in Taipei, they said, you know, what are we doing here? He said, we're bringing Taipei to the world. It wasn't about leasing up the office space. It wasn't about, you know, it was ultimately, but, ult but really what it was all about was bringing Taipei to the world. And I think what that demonstrated was one of the first countries, one of the first places that realized the value of tall buildings in creating locations and creating places in bringing the world's attention and helping to, to elevate cities onto the world stage. And I think Taipei did an incredible job of it and was one of those leading places. Without the success of that and Petronas Towers, you know, we might not have had those other, the explosion of tall buildings around the world uh, that did the same thing. We're also very lucky to work on ICC. We've had many different um, uh, opportunities to work with KPF on lots of different projects. And I think it's, I'd just like to say, I think it's very sad. You know, Paul Katz isn't here, who's been such an important part of of CTVUH for so many years, um, 
uh, and he will miss, obviously. Um, and ICC, an important and fantastic project, third tallest building in the world, incredibly exciting. One of the things it taught me, um, it emptied central, sorry, Hong Kong land. I know there's a representative of Hong Kong land here. It emptied central. It was, it, it was 50% uh, of the building was 100% complete before the rest of the building was occupied. Quite an incredible story of, of, of leasing success. And what it taught me was that we created a brand and, and we created a whole story. We created a vision for the project for uh, Sun Hong Kai. And they plastered Hong Kong with it. Shock and awe. I have never seen a marketing and advertising campaign that had so much effort put into it. And you, for about a year or two years, you could not move in Hong Kong for swooshing green and, and, and billowing silk uh, and the story about seeing the future of Hong Kong and what it meant. I mean, they put it everywhere. And for the next three years, every time I spoke to somebody in Hong Kong, they went, oh, you're the people that did the ICC. You're the people that did the green silk. You're the... And you know, it, it worked. Not only did it work in making ICC an incredibly successful, being part of a big team, obviously, we didn't think it was only us, but also it spawned a whole load of, uh, of, of people who then went on to use that and, and borrow that success, which we're obviously um, always pleased to see. This building. Uh, it's so I haven't been in this build. I haven't been to, to Guangzhou since this building was just coming out of the ground. We did all of the marketing for it. We did all the renderings for it. Although France would have been nice if you'd had the actual renderings in the um, in the presentation. You did the up to date ones. We did all the, the renderings for it. Um, uh, obviously now the photographs have taken place, but I think that this was a really exciting building because K11 had this incredible vision for it, and it was you know they were working it through in do lots of different places. It started off in in the K11 Art Mall in Hong Kong. And it's kind of had the culmination in K11 office, and we helped them to articulate what the art of work in the K11 office meant. And we'll see it over the other side. And I think that sky lobby wasn't just a sky lobby. It's not just a transition floor. It's actually, this is across the way. We'll, we'll go in there and having drinks um, afterwards. You came up through there. And actually, this is a, an amenity for the building. This is about a way of creating a community and bringing people together in a very tall building. Uh, and it's based on this idea of art being able to um, help to bring people together. And by driving communities within tall buildings, it helps to make a richer experience and obviously ultimately helps to, to lease and market the building more effectively. And uh, at a stage where we were trying to communicate what um, that sort of thing meant, how do you communicate community in a tall building when you don't know who the occu occupiers are? And trying to get across this idea of K11's vision of an innovative community. Uh, Pacific Gate, another KPF building. Um, I was told to do from San Diego to Guangzhou, and you know that that is that they bookend both of those places. Uh, Pacific Gate, not so tall in terms of super tall, but I think a really interesting project because it was the vision of one developer called Nat Bosa, who had spent 20 years developing in in Pacific in San Diego, making buildings of increasing quality. And one of the things he wanted to do here, he started off his marketing and sales campaign with this idea of selling downtown, of explaining to people why they needed to move into the downtown. What are the benefits of densification? What are the benefits of urbanization? As more and more people in the states are moving up from the suburbs into the center of the city, and he did a whole exhibition about explaining to people what he was doing to, to San Diego, how he was improving San Diego, and what the benefits were of living there before he even started his sales and marketing campaign, although obviously they were allied and connected. And as we get more and more, these buildings get taller and these buildings get more, more popular, we're now doing more and more residential buildings. And in one Manhattan Square, this is a, an Exdale building in, uh, in Manhattan, next to the Manhattan Bridge, uh, 760 apartments. They have 150,000 square feet of amenities, 150,000 square feet of amenities at the ground floor. They have everything you could possibly imagine that you would need to do in a building. Basketball courts, indoor swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool, fire pits, barbecues, demonstration kitchens, wine cellars, cinemas, I mean, climbing walls, you name it. Everything you could put in this building, they put in this building. And what they're trying to do, as they say, is create a vertical village. They're trying to take something that is spread out uh, across a kilometre along the ground, and they're trying to collect it all up and put it into one place so that ultimately never pe people never le need to leave. But they really want to create a village feel. And again with Excel, um, we're working with them at the other um, at the other end of Manhattan on a building called Central Park Tower, which will be subject to uh, how you define these things, the tallest residential building in the world or something like that. Um, and there, we had this conversation with um, uh, with Gary Barnett at Excel about, he said, I said, well, come on, let's talk about why this building is great. And we've sort of, um, you know, what is special about this building? He said, well, we've got the best floor plates. I said, okay, but with all due respect, Gary, every developer I've ever spoken to has always said, we've got the best floor plates. And no, no one has yet told me why 
they've got the best floor plates and I'd like to know, I'd like you to tell me why your floor plates are the best. He said, well, you know, they're just the best. And this is a problem that I have with a lot of developers, a lot of people we talk to on things like this, is not really going into what it is, spe what is special about their project. And you know what? We all deal with world-class projects. All the projects we work on are world-class. And saying things that are world-class are just not enough to make them stand out and special. And it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that I call, as you can see, Trump positioning, which is, it's going to be great. Well, why is it going to be great? It just is. It's the best. Why is it? Well, it just is the best. And fair credit to, to Excel, you know, we, we pushed them and we pushed them and we pushed them and they really went into understanding what it is about their project that is great and what it is, what have they done that's special uh, that makes it stand out. Um, not only is it, you know, the tallest, but that's obviously something which is fleeting, you can't uh, hold on to, to ever. Um, but actually what they worked out is a, a whole series of criteria which they think are really important based around, firstly, the collection of the of the site and putting together a site of scale on 57th Street, a street that they've turned into Billionaire's Row through all their previous developments. And so this graphic is a, is a process we're working through to describe the fact that at Central Park Tower you can get a building, uh, you can get a floor plate bigger than any other, closer to Central Park and higher than any other, and it's those combination of things which makes it stand out and makes it definitive and makes it a definitive skyscraper in New York and, and that's part of the work we're going through with them. Now, I think we have to be really careful, I'm going to touch on just residential for a minute, about understanding what tall buildings really offer their inhabitants. Um, and I think that, you know, most of the time we sell ego, we sell views, and we sell an inner city location. And I think it was very interesting seeing one of the presentations yesterday that most uh, commercial occupiers, what do they say is important to them in tall buildings? Brand, right? So it's the same. For residential, it's ego. For companies, it's brand. And, you know, we sell that. That's... Uh, um, one of the renderings for Central Park Tower, it's about ego, it's about me and that place and how special I am for being part of it. But yes, of course, it's about these amazing views and it's about views that you can't get anywhere else and absolutely it's about an inner city location. But, you know, there are more things than that, obviously. You know, what are the actual benefits? Well, it means you can pull together a whole load of stuff really close to you that you couldn't get otherwise, like at one Manhattan Square in their village of incre incredible amenities. You don't have to walk long distances to go to the gym. It's all there in one place, thanks to our vertical transport engineers. It's proximity to the excitement of the city and all those brilliant things. And yes, there's security. You're not going to get robbed if you're on the 100th floor, probably. And yes, there's absolute modernity. You can be at the cutting edge of everything. But unfortunately, I think also, it can be loneliness. And this um, this uh, uh, Toronto, University of Toronto uh, statistics here, 81% of people in single detached homes know their neighbours' names. Only 56% of people in tall buildings. 22% in single, uh, of single detached homes feel alone. 39% of people in tall buildings. And it goes on that it's, it's harder to make friends in tall buildings, and it's something that we need to think about. We can't just keep putting people up in the sky and not thinking about the human elements and the human issues. So what should they offer? What should we be doing to make people more attractive to tall buildings? Well, I think that you know, the world has changed. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was all about the, the, it was about the organization. Now it's about the individual. We're absolutely focused on the individual. And we have to accept that people want, resp they want responsiveness from everything, right? Everything we do, we expect it to give us something, to, to immediately react to us. Uh, and it's something that I call the roots of the tree. And I think that if one of the things that I have criticisms, I've got lots of criticisms of architectures, architects, but now's not the time to go into them. Um, one of the criticisms I have is this, is this we, we persist in thinking about the object, right? This, this thing, thing on a piece of paper that can be 3D printed and be held in your hand. And that is the trunk of the tree. And the foliage is how beautiful this tree is. And yes, it offers lots of benefits. But I think what we have to think about in the future is the roots of the tree, is the stuff that goes underneath it and connects into our lives in lots of different ways. Um, connecting to our lives both digitally, um, emotionally and physically, whether it's at the ground floor plane, but also the way that touches our homes and the way, our, way that we come into the building. And it might be something as simple of, of connecting socially. This is a Twitter page. This is the Gherkin's Twitter feed. The Gherkin has a Twitter feed. And actually, it's a joke Twitter feed. Uh, and it says here, the Gherkin tweeting to somebody in the building, uh, excuse me, madam, did you just slip a salt shaker in your bag outside on the tables? Ruffian. Uh, and it says rude things. It creeps rude things to the people in its building, but it has a relationship with them. We all expect now that our phones give us, I can walk onto a plane with my phone, but to go into a building, I have to print out a little piece of paper and put it in a plastic wallet and put it in my pocket. It's crazy. Um, you know, that we have, I have uh, access with maps that tell me how to go around places, but still I have to follow signage in a building. Um, I can now on my phone connect to my thermostat, to my smoke detector, and all of those things, wireless lights, all of those things that I expect to have um, in my life, but perhaps not in my office building. Or buildings like this in Copenhagen, where they're bringing cycling into the front of a building and creating, you know, really exciting places that understand how you want to get there and how you travel from home. Um, 
and I've, I've stolen this from uh, John Previck's presentation yesterday, John Previck from Make, who talked about the vital city. And I think this is what it's about, about creating human density, not just density. It's about a place, place where society, where services and amenities are nearby that bring people together, not just services. One minute left. I've only got a couple of slides left. Um, and I just wanted to touch very quickly on this. This is the Barbican. A lot of people recognize this project in London. It was built in the 1960s, uh, planned in the 1940s, uh, 1950s after you know, a large part of London was cleared. Um, and it was, until only a couple of years ago, the tallest residential tower in the city of London. Um, and it's a beautiful, people, people, there's a waiting list to get into the Barbican. And it's a mixture of high rise and low rise and parks and gardens and beautiful greenery and forestation in the city. You can see that, you know, bringing greenery into where we live is not an entirely new thing. There's an art center uh, and people have created a really, really, really strong sense of community in this tall tower and this ground scraper in this urban plain. Uh, and this is their website, the community website, Barbican Life, where the community come together and understand what it means to live in this building and what they can get out of it. And, and look, residents bulb planting. And, and that's what it all comes down to. There's, a, there's a, a, a Chinese proverb, I believe, which says, if you want to be happy for an hour, get drunk. If you want to be happy for a year, get married. If you want to be happy for life, get a garden. Uh, and that's, that seems to be the secret to happiness in cities, um, or at least it is in the Barbican. So I think what we need to do and what we should be looking for and how do we sell and create exciting places that people want to live in, that people want to occupy, people want to go to, is we have to create vertical places. And then to steal another word, a line from John Previck, who's gone home, but I'll tell him that I stole his stuff, um, creating vital vertical places. Thank you very much. Thank you.